Ambassador DeLaunt, members of the council, guests and friends, on behalf of our board of trustees, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the council this evening. Um, this is our Christmas season program. Uh, the reception is in honor of the uh, late uh, Secretary of State, Alexander Haig. Um, every Christmas season, the reception is sponsored in his, his honor. And I would also like to uh, thank uh, an anonymous donor for sponsoring the rebroadcast, uh, which goes out, of course, on a set of stations and is on YouTube as well. Um, but in any case, we, we thank uh, the Alexander Haig Found, uh, Memorial Fund uh, for this evening's reception. The, uh, the topic this evening, as you all know, are new, is new opportunities uh, in the French-American and transatlantic partnerships. Um, given France's vigor in foreign policy today, I, I'm eager to know what our new opportunities will be. Uh, as you all know, she was a, a leader with respect to uh, the Libyan action where the United States for the first time coined the phrase of leading from behind. And, uh, and certainly uh, these, they've made recommendations about the use of air power in Syria. They've been a major voice in the negotiations leading up to the agreements on Iran. And as you know, it's French troops that are trying to bring order in Mali in the Central African Republic. So it's, it's a time in which the French uh, vigor in foreign policy is, is very, very clear. So we certainly look forward to the presentation this, this evening. Uh, the ambassador uh, has had a, a set of interesting assignments, I think, in his career very early in the ball game. His first one was to Bonn during the time of German unification when he was responsible for uh, aspects of the economic integration. Uh, he has uh, served in the French Department of uh, Security, uh, Strategy, and Disarmament uh, in the French Foreign Ministry. And then as a member of President Chirac's foreign policy team, had responsibilities for European and transatlantic strategic and defense matters, uh, during which time, I believe it's true, he was the major uh, supervisor of the French participation in, in Bosnia. The, uh, he served uh, as a member of the Foreign Minister's Cabinet. He's also served as a Deputy uh, Director of the uh, Foreign Minister's Office. Uh, in the experience rel relative to becoming American Ambassador, although all of those things are relevant to that, and certainly the security background is, is a clear thread. But he has been the uh, Press and Communications Director in Washington. He also served as General Consul uh, in New York City. And then as a further introduction to this part of the world, he was ambassador of uh, France to Canada. And of course, before becoming, uh, uh, attaining his present position in 2011 as ambassador of France to the United States. It's uh, an enormous pleasure to present to you uh, His Excellency Francois de Lac. Thank, thank you very much, President, for your uh, kind introduction without reading any notes. That's, that's why you are the President. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's a, a great uh, pleasure for our press and communication uh, attaché, Arnaud Guillois, and for me to be here uh, with you tonight. And it is a great privilege to speak to such a, a distinguished uh, audience. I hope you will forgive my French accent, which is terrible. <laughs> I have two younger boys, 17 and 13 years old. It's not the easiest age for, for two boys, we all know that. <laughs> and when they listen to me speaking English, either they laugh or they correct me, or both, mostly both. <laughs> So I hope you would neither laugh nor correct me, but you should. I would like to start by uh, thanking Mr. Frank Bird, President of uh, the Baltimore Council on Foreign Affairs, uh, the Chairman, 
and the trustees for inviting me and giving me this uh, wonderful opportunity. One of your missions, I believe, is to, one of the missions of the council is to bring the world, so to speak, to uh, America and to Baltimore in particular. So today I'm proud to be the world. <laughs> and here you recognize the well-known and traditional French modesty, of course. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, speaking of uh, French-American relations, I believe it's important to always keep in mind our shared values and history, because that's what makes our relationship truly unique. There can be some bumps in the road, as you say, here and there, but our relationship is deeply rooted in our shared values. Let's never forget that the United States and France owe each other their very existence as free nations, and that from Lafayette and Yorktown to the battlefields of World War I and the beaches of Normandy, we have always, when the chips are down, always stood shoulder to shoulder to defend and promote the values of freedom and democracy that, after all, our two countries gave the world over 200 uh, years ago. We French will never forget the many Americans who risked and often sacrificed their young lives during the two world wars to restore our freedom. On November 11th, uh, for Veterans Day, I went to New York to bestow uh, the Legion of Honor, France's highest award, upon 35 American veterans of World War II. I can tell you there was no dry eye in the room, mine probably the least dry of all, and this was one of the most um, moving experiences of my entire life. And on June 6 of next year, we'll celebrate the 70th anniversary of the Normandy landings. President Hollande uh, invited President Obama to come to France, to Normandy, to celebrate this uh, anniversary. I hope it will all work and it will be again very, very moving. Against this uh, historical uh, backdrop, I have good news tonight. French-American relations uh, have never been closer than they are today. At the political level, the relationship between our two presidents is strong and characterized by great trust. It's true, as I said, between President Obama, President Hollande, between Secretary Kerry and his French counterpart, Laurent Fabius, between uh, Secretary Chuck Hagel and his French colleague, Jean-Yves Le Drian, and I could go on and on. It's also true with the Congress. Ten years ago, it was a rough time at the peak of the Iraq crisis. We had no French caucus in the American Congress. Ten years later, today, we have one of the strongest foreign caucuses on the Hill, more than 100 uh, members of the Senate and the House belonging to the French caucus. So it's another world demonstrating what I said about the trust that we have built over the years. And as you can probably feel, the friendship between our two countries is one of the passions uh, of my life, and I'm quite optimistic about it today. Even more so because uh, in two months now, two months from now, will, uh, President Hollande, the French president, will pay a state visit to the United States. That will be on February the 10th and the 11th. And the last state visit of a French president in the US took place in 96, so a long time ago, to tell you how much we invest on this visit and how much we hope it will help us together promote our partnership from here to, uh, to there, to another level. That's for the political front, so to, so to speak. On the diplomatic and uh, national security front, which is, I believe, of particular interest for, for you, uh, the US and France are each other's closest allies in the fight against terrorism. Please don't repeat it to my British colleague. <laughs> who is a great friend, so he will not blame me. Uh, 
the fact that we are each other's closest allies in this fight, existential fight, by the way, against terrorism, was illustrated, I believe, in uh, Mali, by France's military operation in Mali at the heart of Sahel in Africa, with much uh, appreciated American support to combat Al-Qaeda in this part of the world, in Africa. Mali, by the way, was a much larger operation than reported in the American press because we had to fight there against one of the best trained, best uh, funded, and best equipped Al-Qaeda branches uh, in the world based on years, if not decades, of drug trafficking, weapons uh, smuggling, human trafficking, based also on a, a very violent leadership as a, a direct result of the so-called Black Decade in Algeria. So the leadership of Al-Qaeda in this part of the world is among the toughest and the, ruth, the most ruthless uh, in the world. We succeeded militarily, again with your support, and I cannot thank you enough for that, in terms of airlift, in terms of uh, intelligence sharing, in terms of air-to-air -air, uh, refueling. So we succeeded militarily. We also succeeded in Mali in initiating a political process that led to free elections in this country. And believe me, free elections in this country don't happen every morning. Mali and the Sahel, the whole region as a whole, remain, of course, a challenge for the years to come. So our two countries have to stay committed to the region and to Africa more broadly in terms of security, but also in terms of economic development. This is true for other African countries like Libya and the Central African Republic, C-A-R, CAR, the Central African Republic at the heart of Africa is going through a humanitarian and political crisis of unprecedented gravity with growing hostility between the Christian majority of the country and the Muslim minority of the same country. And the, the implosion of this nation, Central African Republic, would or could destabilize the whole region. That's why France has been trying to mobilize, so to speak, the international community through the United Nations. It's never easy, but we made some effort, some progress in this respect with two consecutive resolutions at the Security Council. And we have deployed roughly 1,600 French troops on site in CAR over the last days. Here again, with much appreciated American support, with three key objectives to prevent a humanitarian uh, tragedy, disaster. Number two, to help reestablish security in a country. And three, to prepare a political transition leading to free and, if possible, fair uh, elections. Another example on the diplomatic front is Iran. The US and France are at the forefront of international efforts to prevent Iran from becoming a nuclear weapon state. We consider, we French consider this is absolutely vital for at least three reasons. Number one, the security of Israel. We all know that the nuclear armed Iran would be an existential threat to Israel. Number two, a nuclear armed or capable Iran would risk trigger an arms race and potentially a nuclear arms race in the Middle East. Is that what we need in the most volatile region of the world? We don't think so. And number three, a nuclear armed or capable Iran would uh, kill, destroy overnight the international non-proliferation regime that we patiently built over the last years and decades. So we cannot compromise on this. Uh, Iran should not, must not get nuclear. With the so-called P5 plus one, and thanks to the unprecedented level of sanctions toward Iran, we reached an interim agreement in Geneva on November the, the 25th, 
We are currently working hard, uh, hand in hand, together with our other partners to implement this agreement and to supplement and strengthen it. On Syria now, it is thanks to a strong US, French political and military pressure, and military pressure, and we were quite alone, quite frankly, on this boat, that we have succeeded to initiate the dismantling of the Syrian nuclear, uh, the Syrian chemical uh, arsenal. And, on, and our two countries are also working closely together on the humanitarian and the political fronts. We support the coming conference in Geneva next month, that will be on uh, January the 22nd, aimed at leading to a political transition in Syria. Easier said than done, but we have to stick to this objective because it's absolutely critical. So that's for the foreign policy side. Now, the economic partnership between our two countries is also growing stronger every year. To give you just one or two uh, examples, France is one of the five leading foreign investors in the United States with 3,000 French companies supporting more than 600,000 uh, American jobs. Maryland is a key and growing player in this respect, and France is one of the leading foreign investors here in Maryland and in uh, the region of Baltimore uh, in particular, with many French companies supporting several thousand jobs in the, in the area such as Veolia Transportation in the shuttles and taxis, Zodiac, which sells its famous boats to the American Army, Algeco and Sogeti in the uh, IT industry, the Benet Beneteau Group, Beneto Group, whose facilities I just visited in Annapolis, Alstom, and I'm particular, particularly proud of the state of Maryland's decision to choose Alstom to revamp uh, Baltimore's metro. I hope it will go well. Conversely, the United States is the number one foreign investor in my country, supporting here again around 600,000 French jobs, so it's critically important for us. And the, the positive thing is that the American investment to France has increased by 40 percent over the last uh, two or three years. And overall, France is one of the top five destinations worldwide for direct foreign investment. And this is absolutely uh, critical. This figure, the fact that we are in the top 10 uh, destinations worldwide for direct investment, says a lot about the vitality uh, of the French economy, says a lot about the fact that the situation in the Eurozone is finally slowly but surely back on track under Franco-German, let's say German-French leadership on this. <laughs> this says a lot about the structural pro-growth, pro-business reforms that we are implementing in France, including in bringing more uh, flexibility into our labor market and to reduce the costs of labor. Last but not least, these figures say a lot about the many competitive assets that we as, as a country have. You know a bit about our well-educated workforce, first-class infrastructure, uh, our strategic position within uh, the European Union with its 500 million consumers, people. But let me underline three of the assets that, that we have, among many others. Number one, France is the demographic exception in Europe. There are only two countries in Europe today having a growing population, France and Ireland, while every other European country has a declining, and in some cases, quickly declining population. And in terms of you know, the vitality of the country, its economy, the innovations process, this is really uh, very important. Number two, if you ask me what is, as ambassador, what is uh, France's priority today? 
all fields uh, combined. I would answer without any hesitation that innovation, I mean research and innovation, are the number one, number two, and number three priority. This is the engine of basically uh, everything. To give you just a few examples, that's why we put in place in my country 71 innovation clusters bringing together the American way, by the way, the industry, the universities, uh, and the public research labs, and it works as it works in this country. Uh, that's also why we established in my country the highest R&D tax credit uh, in the world. And every day, literally every day, I meet American CEOs who tell me, okay, your labor market is so-so, but I invest in France because I believe in your R&D tax credit because it's really uh, super attractive to have uh, this, this tax credit. Uh, in the same vein, France is investing $60 billion uh, of public and private money over a period of six to seven years in research and innovation, public and private partnerships. This is an unprecedented effort in France toward uh, innovation through what we call the Investment for the Future program. And based on this, again, unprecedented effort that is really the top priority, France is in a good position in the three, I think there are more than that, but to summarize the three key technological revolutions that are going on today. Number one, the revolution of the sustainable development, energy, including nuclear energy, the renewables, green tech, and so on, in which many French companies are among the world leaders. I mentioned Veolia a few minutes ago, that's the case. The second technological revolution is the revolution of life sciences, genetics, genomics. Here we have considerable uh, assets through the Pasteur Institute, through Sanofi, one of the leading uh, pharmaceutical industries in the world, through the Curie Institute, the world leader in the fight against uh, the breast cancer, through uh, many other examples I, I could uh, mention. Just keep in mind, for example, I mentioned Sanofi. Sanofi uh, acquired two years ago the American company Genzyme in Boston. It was a $20 billion investment. And today in Boston, I was there a few, a few days ago, they together created Sanofi and Genzyme, one of the leading research poles in the world that is gaining ground literally every, uh, every month. And the third revolution is the digital revolution. For, for a Frenchman, the, world, the word digital is a nightmare. <laughs> because you have the mouth full of it. You, know, you don't know how to pronounce it. So <laughs> you say it better than a digital, digital revolution. And here, it's fair to say that the American uh, leadership in the digital revolution <laughs> remains to a large extent uh, unmatched. So one of my key priorities as ambassador is to promote closer ties between America and France in the field of innovation in the interest of both our countries. In this respect, university, I mean scientific uh, partnerships and university collaborations are most likely today the most dynamic part of the Franco-American partnership. Without exaggerating, I would say that every day, every single day, we at the embassy conclude or help conclude an agreement between a French and an American university on uh, you know, exchanges of students, that's already important, on uh, co-diplomas, joint PhD, uh, joint masters, of course, uh, collaborations between the uh, labs of these universities, but also partnerships between the incubators of these universities, leading to innovation, to new business startups, and so on and so forth. So the university part has become, along the years, a critical part in our partnership 
uh, having to do with innovation. For example, it should come as no surprise that Stanford University, recently established in, uh, I mean, near Paris in France, its uh, European uh, Entrepreneurship Center, and I think it's very encouraging. In the same vein, I think this is a key asset for you in Baltimore with several uh, key and world-class universities, and to begin with, of course, the John Hopkins University and, uh, and Hospital. To promote these partnerships, we at the Embassy have created new entities like the Partner University Fund, which supports three-year academic and research partnerships at the graduate and postdoctoral levels. This is a great success story. To give you just one example, Dr. James Rothman of Yale University, who was a few weeks ago awarded the Nobel Prize in Medicine, is a laureate of our partner University Fund. So if you want to have the Nobel Prize, go through the French Embassy and it <laughs> will be easy. This effort toward innovation, don't want to be too long, goes hand in hand with booming entrepreneurship. And this is a well-kept secret uh, that you won't read a lot in the uh, press, not in the American press, but entrepreneurship is booming in many parts of France. Over the last year, we founded in my country more than 600,000 600, new business startup that has to do with the new entrepreneurial spirit in the younger generations who, as we said before in our dialogue, want to shake, to shake up a bit the older bureaucracies. I think they are right to do so, and it works. It also has to do with the fact that we were able to severely cut red tape, and we know a bit about red tape in Europe. We are able to cut red tape, and today if you are uh, gifted, which is your case more than mine, you can start a business online in 15 minutes in my country. And this is a revolution compared to the bureaucratic nightmare it was uh, a few years ago. So all this says a lot about, the, the, again, the vitality, that's my message here, the vitality of the French uh, economy, reminds us that entrepreneur is a French word, it has to be said. <laughs> And of course, entrepreneurship and innovation go hand in hand, go, go together. So as we can see, the French-American partnership is at its strongest when it can operate on two fronts, shared values, history, and culture on one side. This is really part of our DNA, of our common DNA. But also uh, economic partnership, innovation, cross-investment on the other side. In this respect, the French-American relationship is more than ever one of the pillars of the transatlantic partnerships. And we strongly believe, we in France strongly believe, that the more Asia and China and the emerging world are rising, which is great, by the way, which is a source of opportunities. So the more they are rising, the more the transatlantic partnership is vital for all of us, Europeans and Americans alike, as one of the backbones of today's and tomorrow's world. It's true on the strategic and uh, security front. NATO, the Atlantic Alliance, remains uh, an unmatched alliance and an anchor of stability. That's one of the reasons why we, France, came back, I mean, rejoined NATO's military command structure four years ago. It was a decision by President Sarkozy, confirmed uh, by President Hollande. And as the Obama administration is encouraging us to establish a stronger European pillar within NATO, I believe it's important to remember that France and Britain, in that order, together account for more than 60% of the total military spending of the 27 members of the European Union. So when you Americans think oh, our European friends are not really doing their part in terms of defense, you may be right uh, altogether, but please make the exception for the French and the British because we continue to invest in defense. We think it's critically important. We are ready, as you can see, to send troops abroad to French soldiers, you probably 
saw that were killed yesterday in the Central African Republic. But despite that, there was a strong uh, public support in France and in Britain for defense, for uh, intervention, for staying committed to, to world uh, affairs. This critical importance of the transatlantic partnerships also holds true uh, on the economic front, where Europe and America remain the anchor of the world economy, accounting together for close to 50% of the world's GDP, nearly a third of international trade, and almost two-thirds of international, I mean, innovation worldwide. Moreover, 15 million jobs on the two sides of the Atlantic are directly linked to uh, the transatlantic trade and cross-investment. So confronted with a growing competition from the uh, emerging world, the United States and the European Union have to strengthen their partnership even further. That's where a free trade agreement between uh, the United States and Europe, the European Union, is or can be an important uh, opportunity. And as you know, negotiations are currently underway to try to promote what we call the TTIP, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership. So I don't want to be too long. Let me conclude on, on this positive note and come back to the values I was referring to at the, at the beginning. In today's testing times, challenging times for all of us, the values of freedom and democracy that are at the core of our DNA, we believe are more important than ever. As our best guide, I would even say our best moral compass to confront together the current challenges we face. And in this respect, what you are able to do in Baltimore, in the region, is a great example for all of us in Europe, we are closely watching what you do, and you have this ability that is so American to constantly reinvent yourselves. And we in Europe, we want to remain on the winning side of globalization. This is a strategic goal that we have. And I think the lesson coming from you, and especially from this city, this ability to constantly reinvent yourselves is uh, a wonderful uh, example and a source of, uh, of admiration and inspiration. So let me conclude in French. Vive les États-Unis, vive la France, et vive Baltimore. <laughs>
four to five millions. And based on this difference, they say, hmm, your foreign policy will be, uh, will lean toward the Muslim world. And I think it's not true. I think it's not true. I will tell you why. The Jewish community, and again, no judgment here, of course. The Jewish community has been in France for centuries, if not uh, millionaire, uh, thousand years. So it's part of your, it's part of ourselves, you know. And as the French ambassador, I am the pasta, as the Italians would say, the pasta I'm made of is based, rooted on Judeo-Christian values. So that's one thing. But the Muslim community that we have is of more recent immigration. And so here we have a problem of integration. And I will tell you something, good and bad news. The good news is that after the third generation, after the immigration, after the third generation, uh, the integration of this Muslim population, if it's the right term, Muslim background, in France is going slightly better. And the birth rate, I was mentioning the demographic exception in uh, France. It has nothing to do with the birth rate of any kind of population, because the birth rate of, the, of our immigration from Muslim background after the third generation is not higher anymore than the average birth rate in France. But, so, and the degree of religious practice, by the way, after the third generation is not higher among this population of Muslim descent than the average French population, which is like 10% in France go regularly to the church, where they are Christians, to the synagogue when they are Jewish, to um, the mosque when they are Muslims, 10%. It's a, it's the degree of secularization is stronger than in this country. We can regret it. I mean, no judgment here. But together with this declining degree of religious practice comes a declining birth rate. The two are correlated in the country. That's number one. So it's the problem that we have to face in terms of integration is not a religious problem. That's my point, because after the third generation, the degree of religious practice is not higher anymore than the average in France. So it's not a religious problem, it's an integration, job creation pr problem. Many of these populations from Muslim uh, descent live in impoverished neighborhoods because we in France were not able to provide them with jobs, creating many problems of integration. A few years ago, I was the Council General in New York. Nobody is perfect. And <laughs> when I was in New York, when I had a French minister coming in town, coming to town, I never know, coming in town, which means every day almost, I usually brought him or her in the Bronx, in Harlem, in other neighborhoods where, the, where you Americans were able to initiate a, a virtuous cycle, job creation, public and private investment, and you have transformed former impoverished neighborhoods into vibrant, thriving neighborhoods. And that's what I want to be able to do in my country, to be able to provide jobs to these populations. So my message was a long story to tell you one simple conclusion. We have a problem of integration. I think I would not deny it. That's absolutely clear. It's one of the key challenges of my country, but it's not a religious problem, it's a job creation economic problem. And that's why what we have to do, as I said before, in terms of innovation, entrepreneurship, flexibility, public-private partnership is absolutely critical. And that's where we have, quite frankly, to draw the lessons from the American experience and success, and to draw these lessons in, in Europe and in France in particular. W would you comment on the relationship between France and Germany? That's a good question, because the Franco-German partnership, based on decades of reconciliation after the Second World War, based on the reconciliation between De Gaulle, General De Gaulle, and Adenauer, you know, in the 50s, this Franco-German partnership has become the backbone of the European integration process. In other words, when the two countries agree, we can uh, 
so to speak, mobilize the other European countries and go ahead. When we disagree, we can't, and the European integration process is stuck. And that's why it's so critically important for the two countries to remain the engine of European integration. Otherwise, it will simply stop. And the, I believe the key challenge of the Eurozone, maybe we'll come back to it a bit later, is here. Will we be able, under Franco-German, German-French leadership, to initiate a closer, I mean, a, a more ambitious integration process in order to have not only a common currency, the euro, but also closer coordination of our economic, social, fiscal policies. And in other words, to create a true economic union within Europe and especially within the Eurozone. If we can do that, then we can follow in a way in the, American, in the footsteps of the United States. Although the United States of Europe is maybe too big a dream, but at least to have closer in, uh, growing integration process. If we don't succeed, then we are in trouble. But I'm confident because between my president and Chancellor Angela Merkel, there is a very close partnership, day-to-day -day partnership, between the American and between the German, pardon, and French uh, industry. It's the same. There is a growing partnership. So I, I'm confident in the, uh, the fact that these couple, as we name it in French, le couple franco-allemand, the Franco-German uh, engine, so to speak, will remain the backbone of, not only remain the backbone of Europe, but will remain very close to our American friends to make sure, as I said in my uh, endless speech, that <laughs> the two sides of the Atlantic will face together the, the challenges we, we are confronted with. How would a British withdrawal uh, from the European Union uh, affect the relationships with France and the United States? I thought they would be only easy questions. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a very good question. No, seriously, I will be very blunt, very frank. We need the British in Europe. Of course, that's their decision. And they, will, they will decide whatever they want. But we need the British in Europe. In other words, Europe without the British would just walk on one leg and not on the two legs. Uh, we need their free trade tradition. We need their historical, cultural, cultural perspectives. Believe me, we, I, I said to you uh, as in my introduction that I will never forget the sacrifices of so many Americans, but we'll, not, we'll never forget Churchill. We'll never forget you know, British at the, the darkest days of World War II alone in the storm. And then, of course, with, with you and with Free French, you know, so the British are part of our European dream, part of our uh, DNA, European DNA. And if we have the three together, I don't say any order here, but the French, the Germans, and the British together, we can dream in Europe. You know, we can succeed. Is if one of them is retreating, that will make the European integration process much more difficult. So. Nobody asked me for my advice on this, but if the British Prime Minister called me and said, Francois, what do you think? Should we stay in the European Union? I would answer yes. <laughs> Sir, in the rear at the far side. How, how do you manage to separate church and state so well? <laughs> the religious from the secular. Thank you for the question and for the comments. The truth is that this is really the field, religion and public uh, policy and democracy, where each country has its unique roots, so to speak. But the last thing I would do is to try to lecture anybody here, because we have no lesson, frankly, to give. But it's true that in France, a bit more than in other places, there is a separation between public policy and religion, and we consider, but again, no lesson to give, that religion really belongs to the private sphere, that it is of uh, nobody's uh, interest to know what a leader thinks uh, in terms of, of religion. This is something that belongs to his privacy. But again, the American tradition in this respect is a bit different, slightly different, and I completely uh, respect that. <laughs> but thank you for the, for the question. 
<laughs> yeah. Yes, ma'am. Can you imagine an end game in Syria? And would you comment on the uh, refugee problem? Tough question here. I want to be, to be brief. In Syria, to summarize, we have three problems in one. The first is how to get rid of chemical weapons in Syria. Here, again, thanks to American-French military pressure, frankly, we made some progress. And hopefully, in the coming weeks and months, the chemical uh, stocks in Syria will be destroyed, uh, hopefully all of them. So, number one. Number two, there is a humanitarian tragedy in Syria. 125,000 people killed in two years. Let's put it this way, two years. 125,000 people killed. So for us in Europe, it reminds us a bit about Bosnia. You remember Bosnia 20 years ago? This religious and ethnic and hatred leading to massacres, leading to the I mean, the worst thing that, as, as democracies, we simply cannot accept. You know, if our parents and grandparents stood and often died for peace and democracy, it's not to tolerate today what is happening in Syria. So we try, on the humanitarian front, to help the best we can through Turkey, also to help the, the, the millions, you were right to mention them, millions of refugees coming from Syria to the neighboring countries. And the third uh, domain, so to speak, is the political transition. There is one thing we su together succeeded in. It's it in reaching in Geneva uh, almost two years ago now, one and a half years ago now, an agreement through which the Russians gave, I mean, said we are OK to engage into a political transition in Syria giving the power to a new authority, meaning not Assad. So we are currently working very, very hard, but it's really difficult, to try to work on this agreement and to prepare a new conference, Geneva II, on January the 22nd of next year. And at Geneva II, to try to promote this political transition, because we all know that if we want to solve the humanitarian tragedy, if we want to avoid the chaos from constantly uh, developing in Syria, we have to uh, have a political transition in this country. Easier said than done, of course. But that's along these lines that we are working very, very hard, try to get the Russians on board and the other powers of the region uh, on board. I can tell you, I cannot tell you whether we'll succeed or not, but quite frankly, if we believe in the values I was referring to at the beginning that are our common DNA, we have to, to, to do the, the best we can in, in Syria because three, three hours away from Paris by uh, flight, this is just, just unacceptable, frankly. So we will work hard, uh, but I can tell you whether we will be successful or not. What is sure is that there is a strong uh, agreement between uh, America, both the administration and the Congress across the aisle, and uh, France on, uh, on this. Dr. Faust, the, uh, yeah. there are two questions. What's in the Russian bloodstream? <laughs> and, and how should we orient ourselves toward Russia today? Thank you for the question. <laughs> Very good one. Um, very difficult to say. Many people in this, I mean, many people consider, many observers consider that the problem of Russia is a declining economic power, uh, an ability to, device, to diversify its economy, growing dependency on oil production, growing competition looming from Iran, maybe one day from other countries. And so many people consider that Putin's <coughs> tough attitude has to do with the fact that his uh, economic basis, so to speak, is declining. And so he has to be tougher in order to maintain Russian power. And we all know that for Russia, in the Russian blood, as you said, 
power, you know, balance of power means something that's really in their, in their DNA. So that's one explanation. For us, as democracies, I believe we have no choice. We have to encourage, whenever we can, greater cooperation with Russia. We have to engage them, trying to get them on board, for example, on Iran, to pressure the Iran. For example, on Syria, the Russian role is critical to uh, try to promote a political transition uh, in Syria. But at the same time, quite frankly, we have to do it, of course, with open eyes. Uh, uh, and not, consider, not, not taking from granted a cooperation that is always a bit a, a fight, you know, but engage Syria with open eyes would be, I believe, could be, I believe, our common uh, objective. <laughs> yes, sir. Do you know what's going on in North Korea? <laughs> and, and are you concerned? And are you concerned? Exactly. The short answers would be no, yes. <laughs> <laughs> meaning, you know, meaning yes, we are concerned, of course, because we know that North Korea, along the years, was able to mm, manufacture the ability to build nuclear weapons, both through uh, plutonium and through enriched uranium. So this is a source of major concern. Number two, we are concerned precisely because we don't uh, know exactly what is happening there. A few days ago, we all learned, to our great surprise, quite frankly, in our case, that one of the uncles of the current leader uh, has been ousted, while we know that he was a key leverage for the Chinese to try to pressure the regime. So frankly, it's a bit of a black hole. You say a black hole, a black box, I never know, how to <laughs> Uh, consider the situation of North Korea, but yes, it is a source of major concern because they have not only a few nuclear weapons, but the ability to uh, produce some. And frankly, what we should avoid uh, from doing is to repeat the collective mistakes that we made in North Korea in Iran. And we are talking to Iran, we should keep in mind that we should prevent them from acquiring uh, nuclear weapons or the ability to produce them. Otherwise, 10, 20 years from now, we'll be with Iran in the same situation we are today with North Korea, meaning n n we don't know how to manage the crisis and we don't know the leadership there. I think it's a honest uh, answer to a great question. <laughs> our, our last question, unfortunately. Would you comment on current and future frictions between the United States and France? It's difficult, frankly, to find, really, to find a, some frictions between the two countries. There can be some trade issues, but you know, that's part of life. Uh, there could be some quarrels here and there between our companies fighting for a market. Again, it's part of life. But on the key strategic objectives that we have, fighting against terrorism, preventing proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, promoting democracy in the, Arab, in the Arab world, projecting stability in Africa and in other places, making sure that the new uh, world that is emerging uh, is, I mean, does comply with our core values. Uh, these are the challenges that we have, making sure also that the emerging countries have a greater say in world governance in order for them to accept the world, to help us solve problems, and not to be uh, destructive, so to speak. These are some of the key challenges that we face, but we're exactly in the same boat. So it would be very difficult for me to, uh, to find some frictions uh, that we have. I think confronted with any crisis today, we are among the first countries sitting around the table and honestly trying to say, hey, John, Francois, what do we do? How do we share the risks, the responsibilities? How do we convince other countries to join, to work in a positive spirit? So as I said before, and it's not a diplomatic word, it's not my style, by the way, I think that French-American relations have never been closer uh, than they are today, and I hope it will continue for the centuries to come. <laughs> Thank you.
Well, obviously, we appreciate and thank you for a <laughs> valuable and wonderful <laughs> evening. <laughs> Oh, you're a great guy. What is the national security justification for using the tools that we use on terrorists on the democratically elected leaders of allies and private businesses? So, so that's a great question. Thank you. That's a great question. In fact, as an ambassador to you, you have part of the answer. Because, you know, we, we the intelligence agencies, don't come up with the requirements. The policymakers come up with the requirements. And I agree with you. You're the implementer. I'm asking <laughs> that's right. you the question, what so, is the policy justification? That's right. And so one of those groups would have been, uh, let me think, uh, hold on. Oh, ambassadors. Not me. <laughs> with, all, with all due respect, with all due respect, I appreciate your sense of humor. But the reality is that in an institutional sense, the United States government is doing this. Obviously, as an ambassador, obviously the business person, obviously the elected official, I'd love to hear what the people I'm negotiating with their position is. But we generally don't do that in democratic societies. We don't do that in private business. We do do it in international security. And I'm asking you, what is the national security justification for what we don't do in democracies and what we don't do in private business? Right. So, you know, there is a national intelligence priorities framework. Right. And that framework is driven by the policymakers on the intelligence needs that they have. Those intelligence needs say things like a European financial crisis, where it's going, what's happening on it. These kinds of things result in collection activities. When somebody says, we want to know leadership intentions, um, I'm trying to think, what do you, if you want to know leadership intentions, these are the issues. So I think that's part of the current policy discussion okay. to say, okay, from where I stand, the question is so, do you need all that data? So I would turn it around and say, I actually think there's a better way to do it. We can look at some of these and say, hold it, some of this is not needed from a defend the nation. As a military person, our first priority is to defend this country protect our civil liberties and privacy. Partner with our allies to accomplish that mission, which includes counterterrorism and cyber. And I think those partnerships have greater value than some of the collection. Thank you. And, and we ought to look at it like that. Does that Good make sense? answer. Thank, Thank you, you very much.